So our topic for today is importance of pupil examination. So our learning objectives for today will be uh, to describe a normal pupil. Then we'll be briefly discussing about the anatomy of the pupillary pathway. And then further, we'll be talking about the different types of abnormal pupillary reactions. And lastly, we'll conclude with the diagnostic approach to pupillary abnormality. So let us start with our topic for today, the pupil. So, as we, so what is pupil? A pupil is an aperture in the center of the iris that regulates the amount of light that enters inside the eye. So this regulation of the amount of light uh, is usually done by the two important muscles that are present in the iris. So the two muscles that are present are the circularly arranged constrictor muscles, which are present around the sphincter around the pupillary margin. So these are the sphincter muscles. And when these constrict, when these sphincter muscles contract, they cause the constriction of the pupil. So these sphincter muscles, they are under the parasympathetic control. Then another important muscle that is arranged radially from the root of the iris to the pupillary margins in the iris are the dilator muscles. So what happens when these radially arranged dilator muscles con uh, contract is that the pupil becomes larger or the pupil undergoes midriasis. So this uh, regulation of the pupil, which causes the pupil to uh, dilate, is under the sympathetic nervous system. So we see that the parasympathetic nervous system causes the pupil to constrict by the help of the sphincter muscle and the sympathetic nervous system causes the pupil to dilate by action on the radially arranged dilator muscles. So we see by the action of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, the pupil is constantly into play. The pupil is either because of the parasympathetic overactivity or the sympathetic overactivity. The pupil becomes smaller and larger. And there are a very variety of other stimulus which helps to regulate the size of the pupil. So by regulating the size of the pupil, a number of different activities going on at the same time. As we know that when the room light uh, or the illumination of the room is dim, like in cases of scotopic condition, we need a lot of light to enter inside the eye so that we can get a better contrast, a better focus of the in, um, objects in the space. So at that time, what happens is that during dim illumination, our pupil enlarges. At the same time, when um, there is bright light or in the during the photopic condition, if there is too much of light, it causes light scattering. And besides, when the pupil becomes too large, the there is a lot of aberrations Photo, uh, spherical aberrations and chromatic aberrations, which occur from the peripheral part of the cornea and the peripheral part of the lens. That is why uh, during bright conditions, the pupil tends to constrict. So it is not only regulating the amount of light, it is also regulating our visual acuity by uh, decreasing the aberrations that are occurring because of the dilated pupil. So we see that a lot of activities going on at the same time, and it is because of the muscles, and at the same time, it is also because of the neurological activity that is going on. So besides constriction and the dilatation of the pupil, there is another phenomena that is going on that is also known as the pupillary unrest and the hippus. So these are also the pupillary oscillations, which can be quite subtle in some patients, but in some people, they can be quite obvious also. So unless they are very obvious, like in conditions like chain strokes breathing, these are usually innocuous phenomena. That means these do not have got any pathological uh, harbingers within them. But we have to uh, just differentiate them from the normal pupillary reactions. So with this background, we'll be talking about why we chose this topic, the importance of pupillary reaction today. So what is the importance of evaluating the pupil? Because as we said that it is not only the muscles that are acting here, it is also giving us some idea about the nervous system. So this simple, a quick and non-invasive test of examining the pupil will give us a clue about the health of our eyes as well as the nervous system. Examination of the pupil is an integral part of the neurological assessment because change in the size, equality, and reaction of the pupil can give us an idea about the vital diagnostic information. So by today's class, what we are going to learn is by even careful assessment of the pupil, we may, as eye care professionals, be sometimes the first to diagnose even life-threatening conditions like tumors or aneurysms. 
So I hope by the end of this class, we'll be able to get an idea about how to examine the pupil, how to interpret the findings of the clinical examinations that we perform, so that we may be able to pick up serious conditions and sometimes even avoid unnecessary and expensive tests in cases of benign condition. So with this, we'll start about our topic today. So when we examine the normal pupil, uh, the acronym PERLA is often used. So PERLA is an acronym which stands for pupil, uh, <clears throat> pupil, uh, pupils which are equal and they are regular, they are, reaction, they are reacting to light and accommodation. Though this is very easy and convenient way to describe the pupil, it is often incomplete because it does not give us uh, more information about, let's say, the exact uh, size of the pupil, about uh, the reaction of the pupil, whether it's brisk or not, whether it is sluggish. And another important thing that it misses is the swinging flashlight test. So even though PERLA is very easy to use, we have to add some things to it to make it complete. So now the first thing that we are going to describe about pupil is the size of the pupil. So we know that usually there is a single pupil, it is round, it's regular, it is equal in both the sides, and the size, as we said, of the pupil is never constant. It is ever-changing and sometimes even without any stimulus. So when we talk about the size of the pupil, we usually say it in a range, for example, 2 to 5 millimeter. Otherwise, we can say in a scotopic condition, it's around, let's say, 5 millimeter. And in a photopic condition, it becomes smaller, like, let's say, 2 millimeter. But usually when we talk about the size of the pupil, we say that in terms of a range like 2 to 5 millimeter. So there are a variety of factors, as we've already discussed, that help to change the size of the pupil. So first we'll be talking about the age. Usually we have noticed that in infants or newborns and in elderly, the pupils are usually smaller. They are smaller in infants because the dilator muscles are not very well developed in infants. And in adolescence, the, there is what happens as we grow in childhood and adolescence. In the body, there is an overaction of the sympathetic activity of the body. That is why the pupils tend to become larger when we are adolescents. And again, as we you know, become adults and as we age, the size of the pupil becomes gradually smaller in size. And finally, as we age and we become old, like you are above 50 to 60 years, again, the pupil starts to become smaller. And this is because of the fibrosis that occurs in the sphincter pupillae muscle. So we see that there is a gradual change in the size of the pupil as we age. Then another factor that helps to um, um, affect the size of the pupil is the sleep. Uh, it, what happens while we are sleeping is that there is a parasympathetic dominance. And as we know that the sphincter pupillae is responsible for the, is uh, innervated by the parasympathetic nerves. That is why when there is an overactivity of, of the parasympathetic nervous system, the pupil becomes small or myosed when we are sleeping. Similarly, it has also been noted that in hyperopes, the people who are hyperopic tend to have smaller pupils. So refractive status also uh, affects the size of the pupil. Then sometimes it has also been noticed that people who tend to have darker iris, they have got smaller pupils. So color of the iris may also be, uh, may also be affecting the size of the pupils. Then another important thing to note is that premature baby who uh, usually who are born before the 31st week of gestation, they do not have pupillary light reaction because pupillary light reaction only develops after the 31st week of gestation. So this was about the size of the pupil. Now the second thing we uh, see when we look at the uh, pupil is the shape of the pupil. As we have already discussed, the shape of the pupil should normally become round. It is central and round. But in some condition, pathological conditions, the pupil may be abnormal in shape. So let's see in the first photograph, we can see that the pupil is a uh, keyhole pupil because there is absence of the iris tissue in the inferior six o'clock position of the um, six o'clock position giving it to the uh, giving it the classical keyhole appearance because of the presence of the iris coloboma the second picture in the middle it shows the there is a, a big iridodialysis which means that there is the disinsertion of the iris from its root giving the appearance giving it the appearance big uh, and this uh, appearance 
When the eye to dialysis is usually small, it gives the appearance of a D-shaped pupil. But in this, because it's quite large, we can see that the iris is folding down, leading to this uh, appearance of the pupil. In the third picture, we can see that the pupil is quite large. And this is a case of acute angle closer glaucoma, where we can see circumciliary congestion. The cornea is not as clear in the other pictures. And we can see that the EC, though it's not very easy to appreciate here, the angle is quite shallow. And we can see that in the iris, there are areas of sectoral atrophy in around um, four o'clock position. And there is the pupil is large and it does not react. And in typical cases, it should be vertically oval, though it's not vertically oval in this picture. So a large mid dilated vertically oval pupil uh, in a patient in a patient with the red eye would give us an uh, especially when there is a narrow angle with stony hard eyeball this is a case of angle closer glaucoma excuse me in the picture on the uh, bottom left side we can see that there is a small bulge in the limbus where there is a iris tissue is covered by the conjunctile tissue and in the iris inside it is peaked so this is a case of open globe injury where because there is a small perforation at the limbus the iris has prolapsed out in that area giving it the appearance of a peaked pupil in the last picture on the bottom right side we can see that the pupil is irregular with multiple synechae in the posterior synechae that is attachment between the iris and the lens giving it this appearance of a festooned pupil so this posterior synechae usually occur when there is a intraocular inflammation um, uh, like in cases of trauma or uveitis so after finishing the second part that is the shape of the pupil we have to look at the reflexes of the pupil so as we said the normal reflex of a pupil in response to bright light is constriction so when we shine a torchlight into the left eye the left pupil constricts so that is the normal response but surprisingly what we notice is that when we are shining a torchlight in the left eye the right eye also constricts the right pupil also constricts so this is known as the consensual light reflex. That means when we are shining a torchlight into the left eye, the pupil of the right eye is also constricting. There is a consensual light reflex is present. So that means that there is a normal innovation or the normal efferent pathway is normal. So to understand this consensual light reflex, let's briefly talk about the anatomy of the pupillary pathway. So as we know, when light uh, passes through the pupillary aperture, it first stimulates the photoreceptors, rods and cones in the fovea and the axons of the retinal ganglion cells. They transmit <clears throat> these nerve impulses and pass as the optic nerve. Then the impulses from the optic nerve, they travel via the optic chiasma and the pupillomotor fibers of the nasal side, they cross towards the opposite side. And then the pupillary fibers uh, the, then travel by the optic tract and from the optic tract, they travel to the pretectal nucleus. From the pretectal nucleus, what happens is that the pupillary fibers, they travel to the edingovespal nucleus of both the sides. That is, one decussation has occurred at the optic chiasma, where the nasal fibers are decussating. And from the pretectal nucleus, there's a second decussation occurring, from which, because of which, the pretectal nucleus of one side will be innervating the edingovespal nucleus of both the sides sorry okay so after this it goes to the ciliary ganglion where the synapse occurs and then the fibers or the pupillary fibers they traverse by the short ciliary nerves and they innervate the sphincter pupillae muscle and because of the sympathetic pathway it causes constriction of the pupil so this is the pathway of the uh, sympathetic parasympathetic pathway of the pupillary light reflex which traverses by the optic chiasma, optic tract, pretectal nucleus, where there is bilateral innervation of the edinger vespal nucleus, and then by the third cranial nerve, um, path, it, it traverses to the uh, ciliary ganglion, where it synapses, and then traverses by the short ciliary nerve to innervate the sphincter pupillae muscle to cause the constriction of the pupil. So we know that because the pretectal nucleus is innervating the um, bilateral edinger vespal nucleus. When we shine a torchlight in the one eye, 
both the pupils are constricting. So this is the basis of the consensual light reflex. So if there is no problem in this pathway, if the pretectal nucleus from the pretectal nucleus, the Ettinger-Westphal nucleus is going in a continuity. If there is no problem, then when we are shining a torchlight into one eye, both the eyes or both the pupils should be constricting at the same time. So there is a parasympathetic symptom, uh, uh, nervous system also controls another phenomena that is the near reflex. So the pathway of the near reflex is actually not very well understood, but they have uh, proposed that probably it goes via the uh, same as the visual pathway and from the visual pathway it goes some of the fibers for the near reflex they travel to the frontal lobe and from the frontal lobe like in the um, uh, direct and consensual reflex it travels by the edinger westphal nucleus and to the third nerve and then by the ciliary ganglion they supply through the short ciliary nerve the sphincter pupillae so let's again once briefly discuss the parasympathetic control of the near stimulus so it goes by the retina to the optic nerve to the optic chiasma to the optic tract and unlike in the direct unlike in the pupillary pathway uh, of the um, direct and consensual reflex it does not go to the pretectal nucleus it goes to the lateral geniculate body and from the lateral geniculate body it goes to the optic radiation occipital cortex and from the occipital cortex these fibers for the near reflex they go to the frontal lobe and from the frontal lobe, there are some of the fibers are again travel. Uh, the motor pathway of the uh, near reflex fibers go via the edinger westphal nucleus to the by the third nerve to the ciliary ganglion, and by the short ciliary nerve, they innervate the sphincter pupillae, causing the constriction. So this was the parasympathetic control of the pupillary pathway. Now coming to the sympathetic control of the pupillary size. So the sympathetic uh, fibers, they will uh, supply the dilator pupil to pupillae to cause the dilatation of the pupil. So the sympathetic fibers, they start from the posterior hypothalamus and they travel by the brain stem and they travel to the spinal cord. At the level of CA to T1 to T2 level, from their first synapse occurs at this level. Then from these, uh, from the uh, CA to T1 to T2 level, sorry, T2 to T2 level, the fibers, the second level synapse occurs at the superior cervical ganglion. From these, the fibers for the sympathetic fiber, the sympathetic fibers travel along the internal carotid artery. They traverse via the cavernous sinus and they traverse for a short distance by the sixth nerve, that is the abducens nerve. Then further, they travel via the first branch of the cranial uh, uh, trigeminal nerve. Then they go via the nasociliary nerve and traverse by the ciliary ganglion without synapsing. And then they travel via the long ciliary nerves to, uh, to innervate the dilator pupillae muscles. So the sympathetic current fibers, they travel from the posterior hypothalamus, synapsing at the CA to T1 level, then they traverse to the superior cervical ganglion just below the jaw. Uh, <clears throat> just below the jaw. Then they travel along the internal carotid artery, the cavernous sinus. Then they briefly travel along the fifth, sixth nerve, then the fifth nerve. Then they go along the nasociliary nerve. And without sinus synapsing, they travel the ciliary ganglion. And by the long ciliary nerve, they supply the dilator pupillae muscles. So this is the sympathetic control of the pupillary size. So why are we talking about these? Because if there is problem in any of the levels that we have just described and any of the structures like problem in the superior cervical gland ganglion uh, or any problem in the internal carotid artery, any problem in the cavernous sinus or the nasociliary nerve, then there can be problem in, uh, there will be in a uh, disruption of the sympathetic control leading to pinpoint pupil or leading to a myosed pupil which is also known as the Horner's syndrome, which we'll be discussing later on. So understanding the normal anatomy will help us to understand the pathology and also that manage the treatment later on. So that is why it is in, important to understand the pathway for the pupillary reaction. Now, another important thing to, know, to note while we are talking about the anatomy is that the pathway for the near reflex is ventrally located than the pathway for the light reflex. So let's say that there is a problem in the, so there is a space occupying lesion in the dorsal part of the midbrain. Then because the near reflex is ventrally located, only the light reflex will be gone. 
so when even the light reflex is not present near reflex will be present so this is the anatomical basis for some instances of the light near dissociation of the pupil which we'll be discussing in a while so the important thing to note here is that the pathway for the near reflex is located more ventrally than the pathway for the light reflex now, besides the direct and pupil, uh, direct and consensual pupillary reflex and near reflex, another important reflex is the swinging flashlight reflex. So we'll be discussing about that in detail a little later. So uh, just to mention a few, another some few other important reflexes are the darkness reflex. So there is uh, when there is darkness, there is uh, contraction of the dilated pupillary muscle leading to dilatation of the pupil. The another one is the psychosensory reflex which is a cortical reflex in which in response to a loud noise or pain there is dilatation of the pupil and the other one is the lid closer reflex that is when we are uh, blinking or when we are closing the eyes the pupil becomes constricted and another one is the ciliospinal reflex so in response to the pain in the area of the neck or the uh, 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 in the area of the neck there is dilatation of the ipsilateral pupil so these are some of the other reflexes just to know now we'll learn after knowing about uh, the different types of pupillary reflexes, we'll learn how to perform a pupillary examination. So when we are uh, performing a exa pupillary examination, uh, PERLA is quite helpful. Uh, PERLA, as we have discussed, is the pupils are equal, uh, E for equal, R for um, reacting, uh, and uh, LA is for uh, pupils are equal, regular, round, reacting to light and accommodation. So that is perla. So we have to observe the size of the pupil. Then second, we have to observe the shape and we have to observe whether the, they are equal or not, or we have to look for anisocoria. So what is anisocoria? Anisocoria is a term which is used when one pupil is larger than the other. After observing the size, shape, and regular equality of the pupil, the second thing we have to check is for the response of the pupil. First thing we check is the direct response. The direct response is the constriction of the illuminated pupil. Then third thing we have to look for is the consensual response. That is const uh, constriction of the opposite side pupil. Then we have to re repeat it again in the other eye. Where first we shown the torchlight in right eye and observe for the di direct and consensual. Now we uh, shine the torchlight in the left eye and again observe for the direct and consensual reflex. Now we have to check for the accommodation reflex. So we ask the patient to look at a near target and we observe for the constriction of the pupil. The fourth thing that we observe now is the swinging flashlight test reflex to look for RAPD. So RAPD means the relative afferent pupillary defect. So what are the instruments or uh, things that you are required for pupillary testing? So first thing we require is the bright source of light. So bright source of light could be an indirect ophthalmoscope or simply it could be a bright flashlight. Now to measure the size of the pupil, a pupil gauge can be quite helpful. So a pupil gauge is like a scale in which we it's drawn, the size of the pupils are drawn and the uh, size is roughly mentioned. So when we place it near the pupil, we can roughly say that the pupil is around two millimeter or five millimeter by comparing with the pupil gauge. So another thing is slit lamp. Sometimes when the pupil looks unreactive by a torchlight examination, a careful slit lamp examination may be able to uh, show us stri uh, uh, trace or sectoral kind of um, movement of the iris. So sometimes slit lamp examination can help us to detect uh, small irregularity in the pupil or small changes in the size of the pupil. Neutral density filter is very helpful to objectively quantify the relative afferent pupillary defect. So it is uh, like a, uh, this filter is placed uh, uh, like a prism bar in a bar and it is placed from 0 0.3 log units to 0 0.3 uh, units incremental in the dimension and displaced over the normal eye. And when the uh, uh, and we increase the filter until the relative afferent pupillary defect decreases. So it was quite used previously, but nowadays, because we have got better techniques, uh, neutral density filter is not used so much, but still it can be used to objectively quantify the pupillary, uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. Then the newest method, pupillography. 
which is a, a technique to measure the pupillary reaction using an infrared video camera, which uses a computer software to analyze the image. So this pupillography is recently gaining a lot of importance, especially for refractive surgery purposes, where we measure the mesopic, and, uh, mesopic pupil size but it also can be used for uh, assessing the relative afferent pupillary defect, for assessing the sleep studies, and for even for toxicology purposes to see how much a drug is affecting uh, the central nervous system. Besides that, it is also used for various um, research purposes for various neurological diseases. So in this photograph, you can see various types of pupillography machine. The first photo on the top left side, we can see it's a handheld pupillometer device, which uh, helps to see, uh, which helps us to measure the pupil size. The second, uh, the top, um, the bottom left side, we can see another one, uh, another handheld device to measure the pup uh, a pupillography device to measure the pupil size, and the third one is the uh, desk mounted pupillography in which we can measure the size of the pupil we can also measure the latency of the pupil we can see uh, how many times the pupil is moving one sec uh, one second so it can be an objective way to quantify the reaction of the pupil so uh, the prerequisites for prerequisites for uh, examining a pupil is that uh, for uh, the room should be dimly illuminated uh, or it should be dark room so that we can see a proper visualization of the direct consensual swinging flashlight test. And the only basis for this is that when it is a dimly illuminated room, the pupil becomes larger in size. And when the pupils are larger, it is easier to elicit the different reflexes. So while we are doing the pupillary light reflex, it is very important to ask the patient to look at a distant target because if the patient is looking at you or if the patient is looking at the torchlight, then because of uh, accommodation, myosis is induced and the pupil becomes small and then we will not be able to elicit the different reflexes. That is why we have to just be careful while we are even shining the torchlight that we do not obstruct the patient's view and the torchlight is swung from one eye to another from below the patient without obstructing the uh, distant target. And for near reflex, we have to ensure that the patient, uh, the room is visible enough for the patient to look at the target and also to visualize the pupils. So after ensuring all these things, uh, if we are able to do a pupillary reaction, it's it's very easy, and we are not we are sure not to miss anything. So one such instance who was a, a great uh, physician, he said that examination of the patient starts right as we as the patient enters inside the room. So. So for us ophthalmologists, when we, or even eye care specialists, we sit in the slit lamp and often we don't use a slit uh, a torchlight, but we can see a simple torchlight examination of the pupil can give us a vast sea of knowledge, not only about the status of the eye, but also about the status of the neurolog uh, neurological status of the patient. So a torchlight examination for a pupil is a very important part of examination. Now briefly, we come to the third part of our topic. We'll talk about the abnormal pupillary reactions. So when we talk about the abnormal pupillary reactions, for ease, we can divide it into four categories. One is problem in the afferent pupillary conduction defect. So afferent means the sensory component, which uh, again uh, relates to the optic nerve because the optic nerve is taking the sensory input from the eye. So the first one is the afferent pupillary conduction defect. The second one is the efferent pupillary conductor, uh, conduction defect, which is the motor component. So the motor component of the third nerve is handled by the third, uh, third, cranial, uh, third cranial nerve, the oc oculomotor nerve, and especially the Edinger vespal nucleus of the third nerve. So the uh, second problem is the problem with the third nerve. The third category is that when there is a pupillary light near dissociation. As we discussed just previously, that the light, um, the pupillary pathway for the light, uh, light is slightly dorsally located than the near, uh, the pathway for the near, because of which sometimes lesions in the dorsal part can lead to a pupillary light near dissociation. And the fourth one is the anisocoria. So we'll be discussing about each of them. So afferent pupillary conduction defect. When there is any problem in the optic nerve, then it is known as the afferent pupillary conduction defect. It can be a total afferent pupillary defect 
or it can be a relative pupillary afferent pupillary defect. When it is a total afferent pupillary defect, we can call it simply as an APD. And when it is a relative afferent pupillary defect, it is a RAPD. So uh, our, our total afferent pupillary defect is also known as the amorotic pupil and it is caused by a complete lesion in the optic nerve. Whereas a relative afferent pupillary defect, as the name suggests, is caused by an incomplete optic nerve lesion or sometimes even by severe retinal disease or extensive amblyopia. So here are some a list of causes which can cause a relative RFPD. So optic neuritis is the most common one. Then even uh, besides optic neuritis, any ischemic diseases of the optic nerve or even uh, extensive retinal diseases can cause RAPD and like a big CRU or big retinal detachment. And then advanced glaucoma like can cause um, RAPD. Then there is direct optic nerve damage because of trauma or radiation or tumor can cause RAPD. Uh, retinal detachment, a severe problem in the macula, but let's say a severe macular degeneration, an extensive re retinal lesion caused by CMB or herpes. So these are some of the causes of the RAPD. So as the name suggests, RAPD um, is uh, present when there is a asymmetrical disease of the two optic nerves. If both the optic nerves are, uh, are involved to the same extent, RAPD will not be present. So we will not be able to elicit RAPD. But if both the optic nerves are involved, but one is affected more than another, then the more involved optic nerve will show a RAPD. So our presence of RAPD uh, will uh, does not mean a disease in the single optic nerve as well. And presence uh, and absence of RAPD will also does not ensure that optic nerves are not involved because sometimes both when both optic nerves are involved to the same degree, RAPD may not be there. So to describe RAP, uh, to understand about the RAPD phenomena, let's first discuss about the swinging flashlight reflex. So for a swinging flashlight reflex, we um, what we do is we illuminate the torchlight into one eye for three to four seconds, and then again move to the other eye for three to four seconds, and back to the first eye. Uh, so let's look at this uh, diagram. The at, in the first diagram, both the pupils are dilated because we have not shown a torchlight. And as soon as we shine the torchlight in the right eye, we can see that both the uh, pupils have constricted. Then after three to four seconds, we have moved the torchlight to the other eye. And again, there is constriction of the eye. So again, we move the torchlight to the other eye. There is constriction of the eye. So this means that both the optic nerves are functioning to the same degree and um, there is presence of no RAPD. Now let's look at the second photograph. In the second photograph, we can see that uh, in this photograph, the left optic nerve is damaged. This left, uh, let's assume that the left optic nerve is damaged and only 50% of the axons are uh, functioning. So when we give a torchlight of, let's say 100 unit power, the left will only be able to, as a, um, uh, able to feel the power of 50 degree, 50%, because 50% of the axon nerves are, axons are damaged and it will not be able to uh, perceive the rest of the 50% 50, uh, 50 of the light. So when we are not shining a light, both the pupils are equal in size and we can see that they are dilated. Then once we shine the torchlight into the right eye, we see that both the pupils have constricted. Now, when we, after three to four seconds, when we move the torchlight from the right eye to the left eye in the second picture, in the third picture, we can see that the pupil has dilated. Initially, it was constricted because of the consensual reflex of the right eye, which was giving us 100% of the light. But now we know that left eye has got only 50% sensation, so it can only feel 50% of light. The illumination intensity has decreased from 100% to 50%. So there is paradoxical dilatation of the pupil of the left eye. Now when we go back to the right eye, it feels 100% of light. So again, both the pupils of both the left and right eye in the fourth picture have constricted. So this is paradoxical dilatation of the uh, pupil in response to light because the left pupil, uh, the left optic nerve is weak. The left optic nerve is damaged and it cannot perceive the whole 100% of the impulse that is being given to it. So in, I hope you have understood. And in the last, we'll just show it by a video. So in this, you can see the right eye, it's dilating. Again, it's constricting. The right eye is dilating because it cannot perceive 
all the information because the right eye is damaged. So this is the swing flashlight test, which helps us to elicit the relative afferent pupillary defect. Now coming to the efferent pupillary defects. So efferent pupillary defects are characterized when there is absence of both direct and consensual light reflex on the affected pupil. And there's presence of both direct and consensual light reflex on the normal side. Here, there is no problem in the sensory impulse, but the motor impulse is damaged. So the, motor, uh, the affected site uh, near reflex is also absent. That is, the pupil becomes fixed and dilated. So the causes of the efferent pupillary defect, the motor pathway problem in the motor pathway could be because of drugs. The drugs are blocking the motor end plate uh, and various drugs uh, which dilate the pupil, like mydriatics, like atropine. Omatropin, phenylephrine, they, these are the drugs which cause the dilatation of the pupil. Then um, there is internal ophthalmoplasia. So because um, um, internal, so what is internal ophthalmoplasia? Uh, external uh, of the external or uh, extraocular muscles are the, the muscles which help to move the eyeball. And the intraocular muscles are the muscles which help to move the uh, iris uh, which uh, which are innovating the iris so when there is any problem in these muscles it is known as the internal ophthalmoplasia so there are variety of drugs variety of diseases which can lead to internal ophthalmoplasia and the third cause which can cause the problem in the motor pathway is the third cranial nerve palsy as we have already mentioned that uh, the pupillary fibers are travel uh, the motor uh, pupillary fibers they travel by the third cranial nerve if there is any problem in the third cranial nerve it can lead to a problem in the motor pathway so the characteristic of the efferent pupillary pathway is that the affected eye there will be absence of both direct consensual and the near reflex and the pupil is dilated and fixed now, the third type of abnormal pupillary reaction is the pupillary light near dissociation. So it is the situation in which the pupil is responding to the near reflex, but the light reflex is sluggish or it is absent. So the classical cause of pupillary light near dissociation is the Argel Robertson pupil. So this Argel will be discussing about this briefly later on. So this is characteristically seen in tertiary neurosyphilis. Then there are some other causes like bilateral total or regional detachment or sometimes even bilateral optic atrophy can lead to pupillary lightning dissociation and the characteristic dorsal midbrain syndrome in which there is lesion in the dorsal part of the midbrain can lead to this condition. Then there is sometimes neuroperiphal neuropathy that occurs with uh, long-standing diabetes or chronic alcoholism can also lead to this condition and sometimes even adystonic pupil can lead to pupillary lightning dissociation. So we'll be discussing briefly about the important individual topics later on. So the last part is the anisocoria. So the last abnormal pupillary reaction is anisocoria. So as we have mentioned previously, anisocoria is unequal pupil in two eyes. So anisocoria, why is it important to know about it? Because though most of the times anisocoria may be normal and benign in condition because it might be physiological anisocoria, it is also one of the most common causes which uh, helps us to identify light threatening etiologies. So in, in any case of anisocoria, it is very important to get a detailed history and careful physical examination so that we can stratify the etiology and determine whether the patient needs emergent imaging or we can just follow up the patient routinely. So as we discuss about the cases, we'll be more clear about what we are talking about. So when we talk about anisocoria, we talk about physiological anisocoria and pathological anisocoria. So what is physiological anisocoria? The physiological, as the name suggests, is a normal variation and it is not associated with any pathology in the body. So it is present in around 20% of the population. And when there is physiological anisocoria, usually the difference between the size of the two pupils is less than one millimeter. And the pupillary constriction is normal to light and um, uh, it also constricts during the near vision. And uh, sometimes we, can, we have also observed that when there is physiological anisocoria, the sizes may switch. For example, let's say at first uh, examination, the right eye was bigger than on the next examination it might appear that the left eye is bigger but usually what we have to remember is that the difference in the size is always less than one millimeter so the second category of the anisocoria is when there is 
abnormally constricted pupil or the pupil is myosed. So we'll just list, uh, uh, list some causes which lead to a myosed pupil. So the first thing when we see that one pupil is very small in size, we have to see, we have to always ask the history whether the patient is use, using some topical drugs like myotics or pilocarpine for glaucoma, or whether the patient is using some painkillers like morphine or for some pain in the body. Then second important, we have to examine the patient, whether the patient is having some symptoms of uveitis, whether there are cells and flares in AC. Then we have to look for the associated signs. For example, in Harness syndrome, along with uh, a myos pupil, we'll see that the, um, the lid is also totic. There is smaller pupillary aperture. There is apparent enough thalamus. So these are the signs will help us to clinch the diagnosis. Then there is Argel Robertson pupil. Usually it is bilateral when both of the pupils are very small and the fundus examination can further help us to see other syphilitic signs. And uh, besides that, obviously neurological signs will also be there. Then sometimes, usually when we talk, talk about Addis pupil, we talk about a dilated pupil. But long-standing Addis pupil may also lead to the atrophy of the sphincter muscles, leading to a small pinpoint pupil. Then a uh, patient who has undergone head injury, if uh, the pupils become small, it might indicate that the patient may have got pontine hemorrhage, and or, um, which, uh, which mandates a urgent CT scan or an MRI scan. So these are the causes of a small pupil. So uh, use of myotics, drugs, iritis, Horner's syndrome, Argel Robertson pupil, and pontine hemorrhage. We have to rule out these conditions when we see that the patient has got small pupil. Then uh, another one is the abnormally dilated pupil. So when we see an abnormally dilated pupil, again, like in the first case, uh, like in myos pupil, the first thing we have to think about is the use of mydriatics because these are most commonly used, whether the patient had uh, used atropine for some examination previously or sometimes even used atropine mistakenly. Then second is whether the patient had an history of trauma because after trauma, uh, there might be sphincter muscle damage and on examination, we might be able to see small sphincter tear at the pupillary margin, which might lead to a dilated pupil. The third is the adystonic pupil. And uh, uh, we'll be discussing briefly about that also later on. Then the fourth important one is the third cranial nerve palsy. And usually um, uh, when we see a case of third cranial nerve palsy, there'll be other associated features of third cranial nerve palsy, that is other extraocular muscles. Uh, like the levator muscle, the uh, superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, all these will also be involved, leading to a totic eyelid and a um, laterally uh, deviated eyeball. So this can also help us to clinch the diagnosis. And the last important thing is acute congestive glaucoma, especially when we see a red uh, patient with headache and vomiting and a red eye with a shallow anterior chamber and a hazy cornea, we have to always rule out a acute and uh, congestive glaucoma. Now, after enumerating the various abnormal reactions, now let's just briefly talk about how we are going to approach a patient with an abnormal pupillary reflex. History is always important. So the patient, uh, when a patient has come with an abnormal pupil, sometimes these are usually incidental findings. The patient, you, uh, you may not have noticed anything. The patient may not have any symptoms at all, or just while applying some eye makeup, uh, the patient might have noticed that one of the pupil was larger than the other or some of the friends may have noticed and they might not actually know the onset of the symptoms. So for this purpose, old photographs are very helpful. So if you ask the patient to just bring some old photographs, magnify them and try to see the pupil, it'll make, uh, you can just observe whether this is a uh, recent onset symptoms or something that has been there for a long time. It could be physiological or it could be Addis pupil which has been there for a long time. So the first thing we have to look for is the presence of old photographs to see when the symptom has actually occurred. Then the second thing is we have to look for signs, any other ocular signs, whether there's presence of ocular pain, redness, headache, because this can uh, mean that maybe it's a case of, especially when there is a dilated pupil, maybe it's a case of glaucoma. Then another thing is the fellow travelers. So fellow travelers means along with the pupil, what are the other things that we can see? in the eyelid, whether there is ptosis. If there is ptosis along with a dilated pupil, we can th think of a third nerve palsy. If there is a ptosis, mild ptosis with a uh, small pupil, we can think of a Horner's syndrome. 
So uh, depending upon what are the other features along associated with the abnormal pupil, we can also help to uh, make the diagnosis. So look for the doses, look for the elevation of the lower lid, that is reverse doses, also seen uh, Horner's syndrome, and hydrosis, which is also a common feature associated with the Horner's syndrome. Then we have to look ask for the history of head trauma because trauma may also lead to a traumatic mitriasis. So look for the history of ocular injury or head injury. Uh, also, when we talk about the abnormal shape, uh, surgery may also be one of the contributors. So ask about the history of ocular surgery or any previous eye disease. Another is birth trauma, especially in congenital cases. Birth trauma may also lead to uh, congenital Horner's syndrome. Then history of drug use, whether the patient is using any systemic drugs, um, <clears throat> any uh, um, like uh, any psychiatric, antipsychiatric drugs, any amitriptyline, or even painkillers like morphine, which may uh, alter the size of the pupil. Then, if there are any other neurological symptoms like any focal weakness or sensory deficits present, then we have to think about many, maybe there is some space occupying lesion in the dorsal midbrain, leading to these. Um, uh, light near dissociation symptoms. If there's presence of multiple cranial nerve palsy, maybe there's some problem, a harness syndrome occurring with the sympathetic uh, in uh, with um, uh, in the uh, cranial uh, with multiple cranial nerve involvement. So history of headache, history of weight loss, appetite loss, hoarseness of voice, all suggesting uh, tumors <clears throat> along with harness syndrome. So when we see that when there's a presence of syphilis, then think about Argel Robertson pupil, with a small pupil, in diabetes, hypertension, you know, all these are uh, causes of small pupil. If there's a presence of eye pain and there's a red eye with blurred vision, it can be presence of, there can be presence of iritis. So we should always look for cells and flare in AC. And if there is a, all of these along with the halos around bright light, Maybe there is glaucoma, ECG is occurring, so always look for a shallow anterior chamber. And when there is photophobia along with difficulty with near focus, we can think of adystonic pupil. And uh, another thing is like dr use of drug also. If the patient is using ocarist for, uh, for some time because of red eye in one eye, that can ocarist also has got phenylephrine. So that is also causing dilatation of the pupil. In fact, uh, just recently one of my patients had come with uh, dilated one pupil and the patient was using ocarist for red eye on and off, which had actually led to the um, dilated pupil. So history is very important before going to other investigations like MRI directly. Now coming to examination, as we said, visual acuity is important. Then we look at the pupils, how they look in bright light, how they look at dim light, look at the, per, uh, look at the perla along with fellow travelers, so by fellow travelers, we mean the other associated symptoms that might be present with um, abnormal pupils, like let's say ptosis, uh, presence of ptosis, uh, presence of um, extraocular uh, restriction of extraocular motility, which help us to, uh, which are associated with these uh, pathologies we have just discussed. Then we have to shine a bright light in each eye to see whether they respond to direct light and consensual light. If there's presence of anisocoria, we have to evaluate whether it is brighter and greater in the dark or light. And we have to see whether the accommodation response is present or not. So check for ptosis, whether there's presence of reverse ptosis, presence of extraocular movement is there or not. In the slit lamp, look at the cornea, the anterior chamber angle, whether there's presence of AC cells and flares. Look at the iris. And then segmental paralysis of the iris leads to a wriggling or undulating movement, also known as the vermiform movement, which is very common and it is characteristic of the adystonic pupil. And this occurs because of the uh, segmental paralysis of the iris. Then look for signs of iritis, look for iris holes and tears, and also always measure the intraocular pressure when you're suspecting angle closer glaucoma. Then other examinations like neurological examination, cranial nerve examination, I'll look for any focal sensory neural and neuromotor de deficits, cerebral dysfunction, look for any masses in the neck, which can be present in uh, Horner's syndrome associated with carotid dissections. So after these investigations, uh, blood examination is also important to rule out uh, like syphilis, um, tumors, chest x-ray, and CT scan, MRI, they can be targeted according to what we think is the pathology. 
So aim of evaluation. So when we are examining the pupil, we want to de uh, determine which pupil is abnormal. Then when there is presence of an abnormal anisocoria, we have to determine whether it is anisocoria or the difference in the size of the pupil occurs more in bright light or dark light. Now let's say that the anisocoria is greater in bright light. It means that the pupil which is larger is abnormal because in bright light, the normal reaction of the pupil should be to constrict. But if it's not able to constrict, that means that the larger pupil is abnormal. Then we'll think about the list of differential diagnosis about the my, uh, mydriatic pupil. Think about the drugs which cause mydriasis, about third nerve palsy, about uh, Addy's pupil, and we'll work up and we'll look for the other signs related to that. Now let's see that the anisocoria was greater in dark light. So in dark light, the pupil uh, should be able to dilate. But if it's not dilating, it's becoming smaller. That means that the smaller pupil is abnormal. So we'll just think about the differential diagnosis we just talked about and the causes of a small pupil and we'll think about those things and just work up for them. So the first step is determine the abnormal pupil by looking at whether the anisocoria is greater in bright light or dim light. Then uh, when there is uh, an isocoria, always measure the size to see whether it's physiological and isocoria, because if it's physiologi uh, physiological, then no other further workup needs to be done. But if it's Horner's syndrome, then we have to rule out whether it's a postganglionic or a preganglionic, because postganglionic is usually caused by mostly benign conditions. But if we are thinking about preganglionic, we may have to do um, a further investigation to find out what is the cause. Then we have to rule out third nerve palsy, but usually third nerve palsy will have other symptoms like uh, other extraocular muscles will be involved. There'll be franctosis, so that will help us to diagnose. Then if there's a history of trauma, find out whether it's traumatic pupil. And if there is <clears throat> a tonicity, tonic pupil, then we a tonically dilated pupil, we have to think about Addy's pupil. So briefly, we'll talk about what a Horner syndrome will look like. So as we said, Horner syndrome is because there is interruption of the sympathetic nervous system. It leads to a, a sympathetic nervous system is supposed to dilate a pupil. So when it is disrupted at some point, it leads to a small pupil, the myosed pupil. It can be congenital, but mostly it is acquired. So here, the anisocoria will be more in dim light. There will be mitosis because um, uh, superior tarsal muscle which uh, elevates around one millimeter of the upper eyelid will be of involved leading to mild ptosis. There will be reverse ptosis which means that the um, uh, inferior tarsal muscle uh, in the inferior lid uh, in the lower lid will also be involved leading to slight um, um, elevation of the lower lid leading to reverse ptosis. Then the myotic people is usually reacting both to light and near uh, but there is a dilatation lag and there is an apparent enophthalmus, and uh, enophthalmus is apparent because it, the eyeball will look small because there is ptosis, but actually there is no enophthalmus. Then if the pseudomotor nerves are also involved, there can be anhydrosis, absence of sweating in the side of the face, and if it is congenital, there can be heterochromia of the iris, that is the affected iris will be lighter in colored. So there can be few tests which can help us to die diagnose or confirm uh, Horner syndrome. One is we can test for dilatation lag. That is, it'll, once we shine light, uh, it constricts. And to dilate, it'll take more time than normal pupils. Then the second one is the cocaine test. So if we put a 10% cocaine, it causes the pup normal pupil to dilate. But in cases of Horner's pupil, there will be either no dilatation or very less dilatation compared to the normal pupil. Then the one person hydroxyamphetamine is further tested to find out the level of um, involvement. Uh, if there is um, an isocoria, uh, if the, there is dilatation, then, then it means that it's a preganglionic lesion. But if there is no dilatation, that means that uh, it is a postganglionic lesion. So hydroxyamphetamine can further help us to uh, determine the level of the Horner syndrome. But usually these tests, uh, cocaine tests and hydroxyamphetamine tests, are usually not done because they are not available also. And nowadays, uh, better um, imaging modalities like MRI uh, can help us to identify the lesions better. So usually they are not done so much these days. Then to identify a third cranial nerve palsy. So a third cranial nerve palsy may be partial or it may be complete. So the typical case will be, I will be down and out. 
So the only mus uh, muscles that are not involved are the lateral rectus muscle and the superior oblique muscle. And because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus and the superior oblique muscle, the eyeball will be pulled down and out. So there may be pupillary involvement. So when there is pupillary involvement along with the down and out eyeball, we can see that the pupil in the affected eye is larger. Uh, because third cranial nerve, as we said, it is the parasympathetic nerve. So when there is loss of the parasympathetic innervation, there'll be unopposed overaction of the sympathetic nervous system leading to dilated pupil. So the, when it is, we, we see a dilated pupil, the most, uh, the most important thing that we need to worry about is the aneurysm, aneurysm of the posterior, cranial, uh, posterior communicating artery. So these aneurysms may burst at any time causing intracranial hemorrhage. That is why they should be identified early by imaging studies and treated upon. So <clears throat> pupillary involvement is very important to diagnose in ocular motor nerve palsy because uh, these indicate that uh, these are compressive lesions because the pupillary fibers like in the in the C um, photograph C we can see that the gray part in the, which is shown by the arrow is the pupillary fibers so these are superficially located so any compressive mass will compress on these first so unlike in ischemic areas which does not in ischemic lesions which will not involve the pupillary fibers a compressive lesion like an aneurysm or a tumor will cause the involvement of pupil that is why pupillary involvement should always be taken as a warning sign in these cases because these are not only ocular emergencies, these are um, life-threatening conditions and they have to be diagnosed as early as possible. Now the another one is the traumatic pupil. So uh, when there is a sphincter pupil is ruptured, they lead to a large pupil. But we can see by careful slit lab examination that there will be a number of notches at the site of the rupture so they'll help us to diagnose so <clears throat> when there is history of trauma with a large pupil we'll think about traumatic mitriasis so if there is uh, uh, intense reaction in the anterior chamber because of trauma it can intense lead to small pupil because of the inflammatory mediators a lot of prostaglandins that will release will lead to a small pupil so trauma can lead to a small pupil as well as a large pupil when there is an open globe injury, that is the sclera or the cornea is prolapsed, then the iris tends to come out from that area. So the pupil will be irregular and peaked in that area. And in cases of closed globe injury, where there is, um, uh, there is, there is no discontinuity of the um, walls of the eyeball, uh, but there is disinsertion of the iris from the iris root, it can lead to a formation of the D-shaped pupil in iridodialysis. So let's briefly talk about adystonic pupil. It's, we have very less time. So adystonic pupil is usually unilateral, occurs in a middle-aged female, and is usually an idiopathic condition that is caused by denervation of the postganglionic supply of the sphincter pupillary muscles. So the pupil is dilated, and we just have discussed previously, there will be segmental paralysis and vermiform movement of the iris. So this is characteristic of the adystonic pupil. So uh, because uh, this, there is a denervation, the pupil will become hypersensitive and there is a tonicity also of the pupil. So other characteristic is the tonic pupil. When we try to shine a direct light, it does not react as well. But when we give a near target, then the near reflex is better. And when the near target is removed, for it to come back to its normal position, it will take some time. So that is why it is known as an adis tonic pupil. So there will be light near dissociation, poor response to light reaction, but better response to near reaction. And um, uh, as we said, there is a denervation hypersensitivity. It will react to topical 0.125%. to A normal pupil will not constrict because of 0.1 to 5%. But because there is hypersensitivity in these cases, even 0.1% pilocarpine will be able to cause um, uh, meiosis in these cases. But if there is no response, we, we can uh, add one person pilocarpine. If one person pilocarpine is able to cause uh, constriction of the pupil, then we have to think about third cranial nerve palsy. But even if there is no constriction after one person pilocarpine, then the last option to think about would be pharmacological mitriasis because of drugs like atropine. So finally, this is a flow chart which will help us to um, diagnose or work up on cases of anisocoria. 
so we have to look at light reaction if, if the light reaction is if the light reaction is brisk and um, we have to, uh, it can be either physiological or Horner's syndrome if the dilatation uh, lag is absent then it can be either physiological or or it can be Horner's syndrome if the light reaction is sluggish we have to think about we have to look for the near reaction if the near reaction is um, wow. also um, as, uh, if the near reaction is good then we think about light near dear dissociation but if both the light and near reaction is sluggish we have to think uh, about Addis pupil so we add 0.1 to 5 percent pilocarpin if it constricts to that then that we confirm that it is Addis but if 0.1 to 5 percent is also not able to constrict the pupil then we measure the intraocular pressure if the intraocular pressure is high, we confirm the diagnosis as an angle closer glaucoma. But if that's not working, and we can add 1% pilocarpin. If it constricts to 1% pilocarpin, it is third cranial nerve palsy. But if it's not constricting to pilocarpin, then we have to think about pharmacological mitriasis. So this chart would help to summarize how we can work up on the case of anisocoria. So with this, this long presentation has come to an end. If there are any questions, you are free to ask. Thank you, Dr. Sanjita Gongasitola, ma'am, for this informative session. Also, thanks to all the attendees for the participation and patience. Now, if you have any queries, then you can write in the chat box, then we can discuss on it. So there are some questions about Perla. So what Perla means? So Perla means uh, it's a, just an acronym which uh, helps us to work up on how to evaluate these pupils. So pupils are which are equal, round, and P means pupils, E means equal, R means round. The second R means uh, reactive to light, L for light, and last A for accommodation. So in short, it uh, just uh, is a technique by which we can evaluate the pupil. So the second question is, oh, the answer is again written in the chat. So the third question is, uh, swinging light, uh, light test to use for RAPD. Yes, I think we've talked about that. Uh, I think the video was quite uh, uh, informative, isn't it? So for pupillary reactions, yeah. there are various yes. Okay. So for pupillary reaction grading, so there are different ways we, which we, we can create pupillary light reaction. I was actually about to include it, but the presentation was becoming very raw, very big. So we can grade it from grade zero to grade five, depending upon the initial constriction, how good is the initial constriction and dilatation. And we can also grade it using the neutral density filters. But uh, hemianopic pupil, Wernicke's hemianopic pupil. So Wernicke's hemianopic pupil, uh, for that it is... Um, not so much um, used these days because for that we have to light only one part of the hemi, hemi retina, hemi, one uh, half of the hemi retina, and it's actually not quite practical. So previously we used to discuss about Wernicke's and hemi anequipix pupil, but uh, these days it, we have found that it is not very practical, and so we are maybe people are using it just for research purposes. So for RAPD in dense amblyopia. Uh, yes, one of the causes of RAPD is also dense amblyopia, but it has to be quite dense, then only we are able to see uh, it. The exact cause, even I'm not sure about why it is. Then why is uh, what is direct light reflex and consensual reflex? Is it the same or difference? Okay, as we've just uh, talked about the pupillary pathway, we saw that there is a decussation in the optic chiasma where the nasal uh, fibers crossed uh, on both the sides. Then there's a second decussation at the at level of the direct commissure where the fibers from the pretectal nucleus go to the Edinger Westphal nucleus. That is why the fibers, uh, that is the pupillary fibers from one eye are, uh, are also going to the other eye. That is why when we shine a torchlight into the one eye, the other eye also constricts at the same time. So even when one eye is completely blind, the impulse from the other eye is going to the other eye, you know, from one eye is going to the other eye. That is why the pupil size remains same even when one eye is blind. So there is no anisocoria. So anisocoria occurs usually when there is motor deficit, motor problems. Uh, in cases of uh, afferent problems or sensory pathway problems, usually there is no anisocoria. Um, 
okay uh, the direction of the light source can also uh, because um, uh, that especially in cases of inter when there is a very bright source of light the question is uh, whether the direction of our source of light will cause an effect in pupillary reaction yes that is quite possible when we are using a very direct light source and the angle of illumination in one eye is direct and in the other eye the same amount of light is not going uh, especially like let's say in case of a uh, dilated pupil then obviously in a dilated pupil the amount of light going will be more than in the undilated pupil so in those cases we may be able to see a RAPD and the same goes for angle of illumination usually uh, in a sa same size of pupil the if the angle of illumination is not very much different uh, it will not make much of a difference but in cases of a dilated pupil the angle of illumination might make a difference so why hyperopes uh, another question is why hyperopes have small pupil um, maybe just related to the anatomy like if you know that hyperopes have a small eyeball small anat lens and all the structures are small maybe that is why the exact cause is not known so in case of anisocoria, can we detect RAPD or not? Yes, just now I just discussed in anisocoria, we may be able to see RAPD. So for RAPD, even if one eye is blind, it does not matter. If we have to uh, look for the right response and even one eye is enough to measure an RAPD. So how to check for near pupillary reaction? Is it the same as swinging flashlight test? So okay, so no, uh, near light reflex is very easy. If the patient is looking at a distant target and you suddenly force the patient to look at a near target around 15 to 20 centimeter away from it, especially if it has got some patterns, then it causes uh, uh, induction of the near reflex. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? I think I've answered most of the questions. If I've missed any, I don't know. Is there any other questions? No, ma'am, that's oh, no, all. Ma Thank you so much, ma'am, for this informative session and all the uh, answering all the queries. And considering the time limits here, I announce the closure of the discussion session. Before ending today's uh, uh, session. Yes. Uh, excuse me, uh, Samagya. Okay, uh, if anybody have a doubt or want to speak with ma'am, you can unmute yourself and proceed the question. If you have any doubts, so we'll be wait for one minute, and after we'll be in the presentation. Okay, I guess we didn't have any questions, so Samika, so I guess you can continue. Okay. Before in today's session, I'd again like to express in my sincere gratitude towards the presenter, Ms. Um, uh, Dr. Sanjita Sitola, ma'am, and uh, thank you all the attendees. I also I'd like to appreciate all the helping hands for the iTalks program. Herewith, I'm ending today's session. All of you to drop your reviews and feedback. Stay, stay safe and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you so much, uh, Sanjita, ma'am. You're most welcome, Kapil. It's actually my pleasure. Uh, ma'am, we want to see you again and again in our platform. So if uh, any other topic if you have, and we'll be welcome you to all, uh, all the time, ma'am. Um, thank you so much, Kapil, for giving me this opportunity. Actually, it's a very nice platform that you have sharing so much of information to so many students here. We are all getting gaining a learning opportunity. So thank you for your innovative uh, efforts. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Thank you. Have a good day, all of you.